Okay, let's move on to John chapter 3, verse 19. Letter J, John, J for John, chapter 3. Observations, table of contents, verse 19. Don't neglect the back end of this chapter. We get up to 316, we think we're done. No, there's some stuff in here you know, got to look up, get familiar with. Just like John 316, you should go through John chapter 2 and chapter 1. So here's 319. Sounds familiar from John chapter 1, actually. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. John likes this idea of light and dark because it explains things in the world. God's creation turned awry. We look at John chapter 1. In him was and will always be life from the beginning of time and creation in the word. He was and will always be the source and sustainer of the life of all things and the source of temporal and eternal life. He was and will always be creator, eternal, and God. And he, the life, was in the beginning and will always be the light of men, the illumination to men of himself as creator, eternal, and God, and of truth about God. Nevertheless, men have deliberately remained in darkness in sin, willfully opposed to comprehending and knowing God. Sounds like it came right from John 3.19, but it came from John chapter 1. Let's look at the verses. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the dark darkness did not comprehend it. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he was with God at the beginning, and all things came into, uh, through him into being. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Creator. See, so... John is reviewing what he said in and wrote in John chapter 1. So, what we have in John chapter 3 verse 19, this is the judgment of God about all mankind. The Word, eternal God, creator, Son of God, who became flesh to dwell among men, Jesus Christ. The embodiment of the righteousness of God, the light of men has come into the world, and men love the darkness of sin rather than the light of God's righteousness. For their deeds were evil. In other words, their intrinsic natures were sinful. There was none righteous amongst all mankind. And without the availability of God's righteousness for individuals to choose to receive through a moment of faith alone, in Christ's atoning for sins alone, all men could be condemned, would be condemned to a destiny of eternal perishing. So we've got the connection between these two passages in John chapter 1 and John 3.19. Go back and review it if you wish. Now in verse 3.20 of John, Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Think about that. So all men love the darkness, all of us. The darkness of sin rather than the light, Jesus Christ. The embodiment of the righteousness of God because their deeds are evil. I hang on to my temporal life. Should I not look to the eternal? The more I look to the eternal, the less I hold on to my evil deeds within my nature. So everyone does evil, even believers. And when they do, they hate their light and they do not come face to face with the light for fear that their evil deeds will be exposed. In other words, for fear that they will be made fully aware of their own unrighteousness before God. Confess and move on. Study scripture like your life depends upon it because it does. Since God gave his one and only son an atoning sacrifice for the sins of all mankind, so that whoever of all mankind believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, then this implies that all mankind has committed sin since all mankind was atoned for by Jesus Christ. This is corroborated by the phrase, but he do, who does not believe is condemned already in John 3.18, implying that every individual has committed acts of sin and needs to express a moment of faith alone in Christ alone or stand condemned for his sins.
So since anyone who has not believed in the Son stands condemned to sin, John 3.18b, and since all men love the darkness of sin rather than the light for their deeds were evil, 319, then everyone does evil at some time during his mortal lifetime. And the word rendered everyone in John 3.20 continues to have in view everyone in the whole world for whom Christ has paid his atoning sacrifice, unlimited atonement. Now in John 3.21, but he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God i.e. by means of or through God. 3.21 So when one does choose to do the truth, it is a, a matter of course while doing such godly righteous acts that one is conscious of and comes by faith to into the light Jesus Christ, acknowledging him, the embodiment of truth and the righteousness of God, in such a manner that one's deeds may be clearly seen, i.e. known that they have been done in God literally by means of or through God. You're so in close connection with God, with Jesus Christ, when you point your life toward doing good, godly good. Keep in mind studying the scriptures to know what that is and then move in that direction with thoughts, words, and deeds. 22 to 30. Came Jesus and his disciples to the land of Judea and there he stayed with them and was baptizing. And John was also baptizing in Anon, near, near to Salem, because there were many waters there, and they were coming and were being baptized. All of Israel was engendered to come. Many did. For John was not yet cast into the prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. There's a man, John the Baptist, who's doing good and is as close to Christ as one could be. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. Emulate this man, John the Baptist. He must increase, but I must decrease. So, after these things, which include his coming to John the Baptist, gathering his first disciples, performing his first miracle at the wedding in Cana, clearing the temple of money changers, speaking with Nicodemus about being born again into the eternal kingdom of God, Jesus began preaching and baptizing with his disciples in Judea. John, who was not yet cast in prison, was also baptizing with his disciples nearby in Anon. Some Jews had a question about purifying so, furthermore, John's disciples declared that all were coming to Jesus to be baptized instead of John. He reminded them that he said that he is not the Christ, but that he was the friend of Christ, the bridegroom to whom the bride, the body of believers, belongs. John declared that he was sent by God to announce and prepare the way for Jesus' coming and then attend to him when he arrived. This was being done. Having been done, John's joy was complete. And so the bridegroom must increase and John must decrease. How he knew these things. So John 31 to 35. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard that he testifies and no one receives his testimony. He has received his testimony and has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. So, the Son of God, the one who has come from heaven, is the supreme authority over all things. Yet mankind has and will largely reject him and his testimony. But he who does, not, does believe in him has set his seal, 
has given his solemn testimony that God is true because it can be seen that he whom God has sent speaks the words of truth, the words of God himself by direction of the Spirit without limit. The Father so loves the Son that he has given all things into his hand. So the Son of God comes from heaven, and he is the supreme authority over all things, implying deity. Yet those who are of the earth or who are limited of, to finite authority, grounded in earthly perspective, and who can only speak of earthly experiences, have for the most part neither received nor acknowledged the testimony of the Son of God, of what he has seen and heard, in spite of the fact that he has, his experience surpasses that of anyone in the universe. Earlier in John chapter 3, Jesus declared that he had indeed come from heaven as the Son of Man. John 3.35. Here's John 3.11-13. I say to you truly, truly, what we have known and we speak of and what we have seen, we testify to in our testimony, we do not, you do not receive. For if earthly things I said to you, Jesus says, and you do not believe now, how if I shall to you say the heavenly things which you, you, you believe, will, will you believe? No. No one is ascended to heaven, Jesus says, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. He's saying these things and they're going into deaf ears. Here's more in Jesus as the Son of Man. Now, John 3.36 He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now how people focus on this word obey. Did he not ask us to believe in him? Obey that. You believed in him. There's nothing else to do. Believe in me, you have eternal life. The believing one, the one who has expressed a moment of faith alone in the Son's atoning sacrifice for sins alone, has immediate possession of eternal life at that moment and forever, because it's eternal. But the opposite, the one who does not ever obey the Son, the one who does not ever choose to be subject to the Son's requirement, which is simply to believe, and that alone, in Him, the one who will never express a moment of faith alone in Christ alone, in order to have eternal life, will not see that life, and the eternal wrath of God remains on him from that first time he rejected believing in the Son. So, the Greek word, the verb there, rendered obey, frequently used in the New Testament, referred to the disobedience of unbelief, refusal in the mind to not give mental assent to the truth about Christ's atoning sacrifice for sins. So, just as the mental attitude of violating God's commandment to not covet is a disobedience of the mind of that commandment, so the attitude of the mind of choosing not to be subject to the Son in the sense of not believing in Him is disobeying God's requirement to believe in His Son in order to receive eternal life. So we don't have an inconsistency in the Bible if you read the context carefully. Just compare John 3.18. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, but he has not, because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. 